We are living today in what some people are referring to as a therapeutic culture. You may have heard that term tossed around. I uh, came across a book this past week, had an interesting title. It, the title was One Nation Under Therapy. <laughs> Perhaps more true than we realize. At any rate, a huge part of what all this means is that feelings have become all important to people. And often, here's the insanity of it all, very often feelings are more important to people than facts. Isn't that amazing? And so in our day, what we're seeing more and more is the idea that feelings have become the basis by which some people determine truth, and feelings have become the basis by which some people are actually determining for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And of course, the thought is out there, there is no such thing as absolute truth. Uh, you perhaps uh, remember we've been talking about that issue for the past couple of weeks. In one article, David Harvey writes this, Today, emotion or feelings, are erroneously equated with insight, and impulse is deemed to be wisdom. Even within the church, some actually see the mind as a hindrance to the discovery of truth. Now that last statement, it seems bizarre, but it's true. I have actually been in church services where you didn't use your mind at all. You could just take it off your head and put your head under the pew because there was nothing of, of thought or rationality at all in that service. Everything about that meeting that I'm thinking of, everything about it was generated to, to create emotion, to stir up emotion, to stir up feeling. Uh, I have even heard people say, don't think, don't think, just go with the flow. Don't let your mind get in the way. I've heard that. It's bizarre. The Bible says that we are to love God with all of our mind. In Isaiah 1.18, we are called to reason. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And then look at this in 2 Timothy 2.7, Paul says, consider what I say. Uh, what I say is in reference to what he was teaching, his doctrine, his, his teaching. So he's saying, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Uh, the word consider comes from a Greek word that means this. It means to ponder to contemplate, to think through, to give mental reflection. What I'm trying to show you is the idea that true insight and understanding is always preceded by mental reflection, by the use of one's mind and reason and logic. You've heard me say before that Christianity is not first and foremost, a religion of faith. It's first and foremost a religion of knowledge and information that calls us to faith. And of course the question is, how reliable, how good is that information? And we believe that it's thorough enough that you can stake your lives on it. And so contrary to what some folks seem to think out there, your mind matters. And you have to use your mind in order to experience and fulfill the great plan that God has for your life. And again, remember this. Jesus said, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, what, would that, what does that mean, loving God with your mind? It means that you use your mind in such a way that you express your love to God. You show 
honor to God, you show love to God in the way that you use your mind. That's the idea. Let me show you another statement by an old Puritan guy, a deep, deep thinker and writer of years ago by the name of John Owen. John Owen was a, a great leader in the church, wrote a lot of great commentaries, and I'd like to read this, but before I do, I want you to remember something about the human soul, the inner life. I've talked about this before, but there are three main facets in the human soul, right? There is uh, mind, volition, or will, and then emotion. It's important to understand that what you see on the screen is meant to be the order of function. For example, the mind contemplates and thinks. Out of that, a choice is made. And then after the choice is made, it all happens instantly, but then there is an emotional response. You see, that's the purpose that God gave you emotions so that you can and could appreciate life. You heard Linda sing that song. And it, as you heard the melody, and as you heard her convey the music, the words, it, it, they move you. You, you. you feel that. Emotions are like the echo of all the activity that's going on in your inner life. Uh, we, it's the great responding apparatus of the soul. And what is life without good emotion? I mean, it would be horrible. However, there is an order of function. That's the point I want you to get. Now, that said, look at what Owen writes. The mind is the leading faculty of the soul. When the mind fixes upon an object or course of action... The will and the affections, the feelings, follow suit. They are incapable of any other consideration. The mind's office is to guide, to direct, to channel, and to lead. Now, on the other hand, let's say, as it is in our time, and <clears throat> even in some Christian circles, very often the mind is being uh, diminished, set aside. And when that happens, what will then take over is the emotions. The emotions will take up the lead role in your life. And believe me, it's pretty difficult to keep the train on the tracks once that happens in your life. And by the way, speaking of trains, I remember years ago, Campus Crusade for Christ, under the leadership of a man by the name of Bill Bright, he came up with a, a diagram of how our lives are meant to function and, and operate. Uh, this is the picture that he created. The mind, will, and emotions corresponding to fact, fact faith, feeling. So notice the idea, fact, faith, feeling. Fact ad addresses the importance of being objective based on God's word and promises. Faith emphasizes trusting in God's word and promise. And then feeling is what occurs as a result of this trusting. But notice again the engine Notice the engine that is driving this train. It's the engine of fact, meaning the objective content of God's Word. And so Bill Bright wrote this, Do not depend on, upon feelings. The promise of God's Word, not our feelings, is our authority. The Christian lives by faith, trust in the trustworthiness of God himself and his word. <clears throat> this train diagram illustrates the relationship between fact, God and his word, faith, 
our trust in God and his word and feeling the result of our faith and our obedience. And so again, my point is this is the kind of order and function that we need to have in our lives if we are going to grow in Christ and mature, and if we are going to uh, be the kind of people who have a very healthy emotional life, uh, uh, an emotional life that is embedded deeply into the peace of God and into the joy of the Lord and the excitement and the adventure uh, that kind of takes us up emotionally when we are in the, this functional place that he is talking about. Of course, we need to do this most of all because God calls all of us as his people to walk in his truth, not our truth. Give up on this idea. You have your truth, I have my truth. That is so, when you hear that, just say, pass the bread because here comes the baloney. <laughs> That's all it is. There is truth, and we are relying upon God's truth. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, on the other hand, think about this picture. What happens if all of this gets turned around? And here's what I mean. Let's say the emotions or the feeling part of our life ends up where the engine is, out in front, leading the way. And so emotion now becomes the engine. And then we end up making choices on the basis of emotion, and the mind actually ends up becoming the caboose. That's where a lot of people are living their lives on a daily basis. In fact, the technical, there's a technical word for what I'm describing here. It's called being subjective or subjectivity. Uh, you've heard me use that term here many times, but I'm not sure everyone understands it. So let me give you this definition that I came up with. Subjectivity is the idea that people are making decisions and judgment, judgments based on individual experiences and feelings instead of outside facts. I'll give you an illustration. Take the abortion issue. There's so much emotion in, in the country when it comes to that issue. But here's the thing. You can't watch a sonogram and, uh, of, in a, a, a pregnant lady. You can't watch a sonogram and tell me that that isn't a person in that belly, in that womb. I mean, factually, it's easy for anyone who has a brain to see that there is a growing, living person, a child, in that picture. But there's so much emotion about this issue. And people don't care about the facts. They would l rather live by the seat of their pants, their emotions. A while back, I, ca I came across an article, interesting article, entitled, The Subjective Captivity of the Church. This is an interesting paragraph. Notice, the feature of this captivity is the tendency to exalt experiences, feelings, impressions, or emotions over, that's the key word, over the Word of God. This captivity does not eliminate or reject God's Word. It simply relocates its authority to the periphery. Once disconnected from a source of ultimate authority, subjectivized Christians suffer gradual dislocation from sound doctrine, increasing loss of discernment, and choices that drift inevitably toward their own sinful drives. 
far from being a necessary evil, emotions, affections, and desires are vital to the Christian life, for they supply our passion for God and help us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we must never confuse vitality with authority. The strength of some sense of emotion must never become the sole determinant of our decisions or actions. Everything must bow to the Word of God. Everything. You see, emotions, again, are so vital and important. They bring color to our life. If you ever are around someone who's suffering from depression, they become almost emotionless. I know I passed through that season at a point in my life, and I know how one feels. And and it's like there is no color to them. And it's a horrible, horrible place to be. Emotions are important to us all. But we are called of God to be sub, not subjective, but objective. That is, we live by outside truth that comes to us, not from within, but from God speaking to us. And that's the call upon our life. Now, let me show you something along this line in Genesis 3. I'd like you to see here that what I'm really talking about is the essence of what we call spiritual warfare. A lot of people make that term very spooky and eerie, but it shouldn't be. This is the essence of what spiritual warfare is all about. Let me show you what I mean. Genesis 3, 1, and the fall of mankind, the story of Adam and Eve. The serpent, and we all know who that is. That's the adversary, Satan. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The point is, he's suggesting God's holding out on you. Your life could be more enhanced, greater than it is, if you would only do things the way I'm suggesting. Look at the rest of this. The woman was convinced, she saw the use of her eyes, that the tree was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she ate, gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, I wonder if you can see here how the enemy works in this process of his deception. His goal is to to diminish God and to cancel God's authority over our lives. And how does he do it? Well, he does it by attacking God's character and God's word as being truthful and reliable, and then what he does, he puts before Eve what seems to be a more appealing and more attractive alternative, something that her feelings are now being drawn to. And so in verse 1, he sows doubt. Has God really said that? Aren't you confused? And then in verse 4, He creates confusion and suspicion. In verse 5, he actually goes in for the kill here with a flat-out lie and suggestion that God really doesn't want what is the best for you. You know better. You, You follow me and you'll really begin to experience the best. You will know both good and evil. You will become like God, he says. And then in verse 6, 
she saw that the tree was beautiful and it looked delicious. What's happening? Feelings are being awakened. And what further is going on is this. Eve goes from living objectively, that is to relying upon God, his character, and his truth. She goes from counting on God to living subjectively, which means she's now living out of her feelings and her desires. Her feelings, her emotions are driving the train pulling the rest of her inner life along. And, of course, uh, the rest is history, isn't it? Here we are today, battling with sin. And this is where it all started. Now, there is one word in all of the Bible that is used repeatedly to describe what I'm talking about here this morning. And that word is this, foolish. Hence the title of the message, Foolish. I'll show you why I say that. Look at Matthew 7, 24. This is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. He means biblically wise. Notice, listens and follows. He is like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise, this speaks of the testings of life, and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is, there's my word, foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. In verse 26, Jesus says, here is the type of person that he calls foolish. And what is that person like? It's a person who hears the word of God. So they, can we say, they show up at church. They sit in Bible class, or they read the Bible, or they listen to truth on the radio, whatever the case may be, but they never act on that truth for whatever reason. And as a result, they fail to establish the kind of foundation for living life that will stand the test of both time and eternity. You see, the testings come and we discover where we're really building. And so many people today, when the testings come their way, they fall apart. Because, because they're, everything is reversed in their, their process of living life. It's all about feelings and emotion as opposed to living their lives based on objective fact, truth. One more text. This is... Ephesians 5, Paul wrote, So, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, biblically wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. Uh, you need to know, the word thoughtlessly is, could actually be translated from the Greek word foolish. That's what foolishness is. It's when you act thoughtlessly. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so, don't be foolish. This is the plea of Scripture. And it's my plea for all of you here this morning. Don't live in this lifestyle that Jesus is talking about. In fact, I want to make this more clear to you this morning. So I came up with seven things. And when I say seven, I don't mean it's going to be the next hour. But just give me a few moments and let me lay out these seven things. And then you think them through and apply them to your life. This is what I would call the doctrine of fools or foolishness. Number one is this. A fool is someone who appears... Well, A fool is the person who appears 
to be always in a hurry when it comes to spiritual things. I take that from the story we read where this individual built a house without checking the foundation. He, he must have said, I, I want to get it up quick. I got to move. I want to get in there. So don't worry about all those little details. Just get it up. And then when the storms of life came, he couldn't stand. The house caved completely in because he was too much in a hurry to be bothered by the detail issues of living out life. There are too many people who are in a rush when it comes to spiritual reality. Some of you are right now thinking, man, when is this over? I see you looking at your watch. There's a ball game on at 1 o'clock. I need to eat. I'm hungry. Always in a rush. Think about that. You're laughing and I'm laughing, but I'm also being very serious. You're always in a hurry. Don't have time to invest in the study of God's Word, Bible doctrine. And some of you, all you get is what you get here on Sunday morning. Don't be in such a hurry. Don't be in the category of foolish that Jesus is talking about. Here's my second point. A fool will always place a high and exaggerated priority on their feelings. I've given this some thought. I think one of the main reasons this is so is because there are a lot of people who simply don't want to be made to think. Because it's, it's hard. It's hard work to think things through, to examine. I would rather feel good. Come on, play another song. Let's get juiced up. Let's, let's dance. Let's move. That's what most people think church is all about today. It's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. I wonder if this might be the issue. Proverbs 18.2, which says, A fool hath no delight in understanding but that his heart may discover itself. You see, when you learn and you hear, you become more and more accountable with your life. I like this text. Scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Because knowledge, increasing knowledge, means accountability and challenge. How about this? Number three, a fool is a person who will rationalize the sting or the violation of their own conscience. Proverbs 14.9 tells us fools make light of sin. They make light of it. That's a, that's a defense mechanism. People rationalize sin. Oh, it's just a white lie, not a lie, lie. Or they will pass the buck of responsibility. Uh, or they will, you know, I've noticed this about a lot of folks. They will say, well, at least I'm not that bad. Look at them. And you can always find someone who is lower on a scale from 1 to 10 than you. And that becomes a defensive mechanism that people use. And, of course, there's a whole variety of those that we've talked about before. But these, th this problem is someone who feels the conviction, but they make light of it. How about this, number four? A foolish person does not take the time to think things through to the end. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And so these are people who think they're always right. Always right. Always right. You know people like that. I'm not... I'm really bothered by this, to be quite honest with you. Because I think people are setting themselves up for a serious collapse at some point in their life. People never think ahead. Now, wait a minute. If I choose this, 
What will happen next year? What will happen five years from now? What's going to happen in my family? How will this decision affect my children? How will it affect my, my testimony before God? It says in Proverbs 4.26, look at this passage. Ponder the path of your feet. The word ponder is like that word consider. It means to think about, to think through, to meditate on the path of your feet, where your feet are taking you, and let all your ways be established. Established how? Established by God's Word. By the objective fact of the Word of God. Let your life presently move you toward the goal that you're heading to, but make sure that all of your ways are established. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path, right? Proverbs 3, 5, 6. How about this? Number five. A fool tends to be more concerned with appearance than with substance. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. And so human boasting is the mark of foolishness. Human boasting is always, as you would, uh, as we all know, Human boasting is driven by a desire to be seen by others. Uh, remember what Jesus, he talked about people in his day who would pray on street corners. He said their motive was actually to be seen of men. To be seen as someone deeply spiritual. Uh, people, uh, people, he said, would give money in such a way so as to be seen of men. Uh, they would fast and do it in such a way that everyone knew and noticed that they were fasting. That was their motivation, to be seen by others. And that, of course, is what Paul is addressing. It's foolish. Number six, a fool is a person who denies God. Psalm 14.1, and then this is repeated in Psalm 53.1, but notice... The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Um, notice in that statement, there is, is in italics, and I deliberately put it that way, because what that means is it's not in the original Hebrew text. It literally, the translators put those two words in there just to make it easier to read. But here's the way it literally reads. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And it, it could mean no God, no God, no God. But it could also mean no God, I won't. I'm not going to do that. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And then lastly, a fool is someone who treats God as if he is irrelevant to everyday life. I take this from Luke chapter 12, verse 20. Jesus tells the story like this. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, notice he doesn't say anything to God here. He says to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. He's going through a real season of prosperity. By the way, notice all the personal pronouns. The I's, the he's, the my. You know, he's really into himself. Verse 17. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have stored enough away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. It's the only place I can discover in all the Bible where God flat out 
says to another human being or to a human being, you fool. And here's why. He said, you will die this very night, then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person. Now, this is Jesus talking. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, he's not saying here that you are a fool to have earthly wealth. He's saying you are being foolish when you put one before the other. When you are only concerned with storing up earthly wealth, independent of a rich relationship of God. I need to ask you this morning, how would you, on a scale from 1 to 10, how would you, as a believer now, how would you state or identify your relationship with God? A 1, 3, 7, where are you at? And I need to ask you this, when it comes to this other issue of, of, of being foolish and how your life works, are you living by objective truth? Fact first. Fact first. Fact is the engine that will drive the Christian life and is meant to. The coal car is faith. Faith is trusting the fact of God's word. And what will happen is this caboose of emotion will come along and you will be amazed at the healthy emotions that you have. I'm amazed in my own life because I know that it's only through God the Holy Spirit that I feel good most of the time. Because it's, it's the Lord who has helped me and helped you, helped others, to, to have emotions that are deeply embedded in God's peace and God's joy, the adventure, the excitement of just having a walk with God that Jesus describes as rich. That should be our goal. But you can't live this way if you are always subjective. The train doesn't stay on the tracks. So you have to focus on living by the Word of God. Let's pray.